I'm on with my very good friend, Marquise Johns. I think he's up there on the Mount Rushmore of great journalism and boxing with Michael Woods, um, Abe Gonzalez, Marquise Johns, Chris Glover, um, people in this industry I deeply respect. So Marquise, thank you for taking your busy time to talk with me. Always, Lukey. Thanks for having me on, man, as always, man. It's good. Good stuff, man, as always, man. Finally, we're getting stuff with the boxing season coming along here, at least. So at least we had something to actually talk about this time around, as opposed to last year. So, I mean, it's 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 good. And let's start with the lead. Oshaki Foster, um, always been generous with his time to me. I'm sure he's always been good to you as well. Your yeah. co-host, who I absolutely love on the Say What You Say podcast, they're in the building. So it feels like I was there because I love your guys' show so much. I feel like I'm your friends. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it feel good story of 2020, I think up there with uh, Roman Villa and Liam Smith is Oshaki Foster. Maybe set the stage for those that don't know about how Oshaki or who I'll refer to now as shock, because it's easier for me to say how mm-hmm. shock got in this position and set the stage for why this was such an emotional title win for him over Ray Vargas. Yeah, it was a big win for him, Luki, because essentially what Foster was coming up for, and correct me if I'm wrong on some of the facts when I'm speaking down on this, uh, pretty much his whole story is just pretty much just a, a, a pretty much a, a, a rags to riches story from, from the onset where he had to deal with pretty much a tragedy in his family. I want to say, was it someone in his family had died? Actually, I want to say it was, I want to say it was, I want to say it was one, of his, one of his brothers, actually. I could be wrong if I'm butchering that. But I do know just, just from, from yeah, just the aspect of him just coming up the rankings with the WBC, he's been pretty much waiting for this mandatory title shot literally since the beginning of this pandemic. Uh, pretty much he had to go fight on random Ring City cards, had to stay busy fighting in Dubai, just just random things just to get keep keep things moving along. And finally, this came along once uh, Shakur Stevenson mi- missed it on the scale, and he pretty much sees, sees the whole moment here. Yeah, I mean – and then let's also set the stage too. Ray Vargas, a very underrated storyline was trying to be uh, the second Mexican fighter in in back to back weeks to be a three division world champion in the same weight class. Kind of like a weird underrated story going into this fight. Everything kind of felt Ray Vargas, and at the press conference. Ray was really out of character trash talking, which I was like, this is very concerning. Like Ray Vargas, typically most boring press conference guy, uh, trash talking this fight. When we look at the stats and I know I don't love, love copy box, but I'm trying my best to give people a picture through copy box. You're looking at Ray Varg or uh, Oshaki Foster throwing oh, basically 101 more punches at 625 to 524 landing 144 compared to Ray Vargas is 101. But the real story is he out threw him in terms of power punches, 87 landed over 286 compared to Ray Vargas at 66 to 225 and jabs. He threw 339 to Ray Vargas's 299 shock landed 57 uh, Vargas landed 35. To me, the numbers paint a picture which were super boring from probably most people listening that says that the one glaring strength that shock had besides being bigger was he was faster. And those numbers he picked, he was able to get in and out. Yeah, pretty much uh, Lukey, a stronger, better, faster, stronger at this point, man. What essentially what what this whole fight was in a nutshell, from from the onset, you could see like in the first four rounds that he essentially, he couldn't get anything going where, I wonder what the fact that with Vargas trash talking beforehand, if, if that was the, what he actually said in the translations, because I will admit, uh, Luki, that some of these translations uh, in that final press conference were a little, little scattergoried. But I'm, I'm trying to figure out what Vargas's game plan was as a whole, because for the first four rounds of this, he only had one approach. And Oshaki, the entire fight, and they, they were mentioning it on the broadcast, which I thought was really interesting, but it didn't happen was, they were looking to see if Oshaki Foster was going to switch stances, like because they're, they're pretty much they're, pretty much they were waiting for him to fight left handed to either end this fight or do something totally different in it, and none of that happened. So I thought that was more impressive than anything. But the, 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 the stats in the whole fight that you just laid out essentially show pretty much laid out a guy who couldn't get anything going, and one guy who pretty much was able to do anything he wanted for pretty much the entire fight. The foot speed of Ray Vargas is very concerning in moving up in weight because it looks like if he doesn't have a major physical advantage, his biggest asset is being taller and counter punching. And there's not really a, a second gear if that's not going to work. 
Yeah, there's that, Luki. And I, stop me if I heard this before. And I, I, usually when I'm on with you on, with, with these shows and for podcasts, man, it always cracks me because we're always somehow in some way or another talking about possible weight bullies in some aspect or another. And we're talking about another one now, obviously, here with Ray Vargas, whose power didn't translate at all, obviously. And pretty much played a very cautious fight. I was talking with with, with Kyle on, on DSA, what you say beforehand, thinking that we was going to get a, a we was going to get this matchup because I this, this kind of tactical matchup because he wasn't going to come in with the same aggression that he did with Max Sio. I I think he saw something in Max Sio where he could just pretty much mu- muscle and push his way around until he got knocked until he got knocked down, obviously in that that Max Sio fight. But this was not the case in this time around, and it was really, really just twelve rounds of one guy just not being able to do anything. I think the only concerning thing to me was in the middle rounds, Shock did t- kind of take his foot off the gas for mm-hmm. periods. Vargas felt like he found himself back in the fight, but it was more so Shock kind of taking a few rounds off or not being as active. I really feel that Shock was so dominant in this fight, he could have gone for a stoppage, but I think the moment was so big to win a world title in Texas. He's from Texas, Houston mm-hmm. fighter. I, I don't think he was going to try to take a chance on such a big moment because he this is his first world title opportunity. And as you beautifully laid out, it's taken him about three years to even get this shot. Yeah, it took him a while, Luki, to get here. And the one thing with uh, Foster, pretty much pretty much with the summary of this whole fight as a whole, and I think he could have got him out of this fight as well early on, personally, if he had he put his foot in the gas. So much to the point, he even asked himself during the fight, I want to say it was either round seven or eight, he asked in his corner after the bell, was he too tentative? And his corner said yes. So even he even he realized that he wasn't putting enough pressure on Vargas in this fight. But he pretty much got him out on the scorecards because Vargas wasn't able to do anything. But it, great story. Not the not not the greatest fight in the world to watch as, as a main event, but great story and really just a great but I, I think that's – Marquise, if we're going to get a fight that's not entertaining – at least it crowns, in my opinion, the number one guy in the weight class. To me, without a shadow of a doubt, Oshaki Foster is now the best 130 pounder because Navarrete has looked rather unenthused. Hector Luis Garcia, no fault of his own, just lost to Tank Davis. And no, that wasn't in that weight class. We, I have concerns about how he will fight at 130. Mm-hmm. And then Oscar Valdez, we haven't really seen him make his triumphant comeback. So by default, I really view Oshaki Foster as the best guy in the division. Yeah, at this point, he is at this point. And it, for me, for the longest, it was uh, Shakur until he moved up. So now that Shakur is gone, but he's the next man up. And the, the names you just rattled off, you can throw in Joe Cordina as well and, and, and a couple of other also rands. But there's 130 yeah, at this Albert point. Albert Bell, too. Albert Bell, not with a major promoter, but undefeated guy who really should be in this combo. He's a top 15 guy. I'm trying to figure out what's going on with a lot of these folks at 130. Why they just can't get any more action going on. But at, at some, the way that the pieces are falling at this point, the, I'm more concerned with what Navarrete is doing at 130 more than anything else. But no, nah, I think Oshaki is the guy to beat at 130. Just stylistically wise, he, he creates a lot of problems with his footwork. If you enjoyed this video and you want to continue to see videos like this one, go to OnlyFans.com slash ITR Boxing. We have a ton of content there. And it's really, really easy to see weekly, never-before-seen videos, some editorials in video form. We have a ton of content that's exclusively over there. And two times a month, we're bringing you full-length documentaries or quarter-length, about 15 to 20-minute documentaries for our OnlyFans. So really go check it out and see what all the buzz is about.